Carbon is easily one of the most versatile elements on the periodic table. Combined with other elements, it is the backbone for an incredible array of compounds, from proteins and polymers, to waxes, oils, gases, and so much more. Even on its own, it can be shaped into a wide array of materials with an equally wide array of properties. On one end, there are things like charcoal, which are relatively soft, brittle, and burn easily. On the other end, there are things like diamond, which are extremely hard and will only burn if superheated in pure oxygen. But in between those two are materials that become more and more interesting as we learn more about them. Two of those are carbon nanotubes and graphene. Carbon nanotubes, like the name implies, are tiny tubes made of pure carbon. They come in a few varieties based on how many layers thick they are, how long they are, and if they're in a powder or neatly aligned in a vertical forest. Graphene, on the other hand, is single atom thick sheets of carbon. Again, it comes in some varieties, in this case based on how many layers remain stacked together, how large the individual sheets are, and whether or not the sheets have been oxidized. In previous videos, we've explored how both of these can be manufactured. Of the two, carbon nanotubes are known to be much more difficult to make, and I can readily confirm that. The reason being is that you can't harvest carbon nanotubes from a natural source, and have to grow them yourself using bottom-up methods. I've attempted everything from an underwater arc, to tube furnaces, to vacuum systems, all to no avail. However, I've recently found a new method and have been investigating it to see if it's more feasible. We'll be exploring the results of that in the near future. Graphene, unlike carbon nanotubes, is much easier to make because we can use top-down methods to prepare it, though bottom-up methods work as well. Previously, we used an ultrasonic bath to treat graphite powder and convert it into graphene. On an atomic scale, graphite is just millions of layers of graphene, and so the ultrasound gently shakes apart the layers with the help of the special solvent. In that video, we started with graphite powder which, while effective, meant we were making very small pieces of graphene. To make larger sheets this way, we need to start with a different graphite source, and treat it before we sonicate it, and that's what we'll be exploring in this video. To start off, we'll be using graphite foil as our starting material, though a slice of natural graphite would also work. I've found that of the two, graphite foil is easier to find, and usually far cheaper. Instead of an ultrasound, we'll be using electrolysis to shear the layers apart. For this reaction, we only need a few things. The first is our graphite foil, and I'm using 0.25mm thick sheets, though pretty much any size will work. Then we'll need an inorganic sulfate salt. Here I'm using iron sulfate, but sodium sulfate and ammonium sulfate should work as well. If possible, use the sodium and ammonium salts. The iron sulfite ended up contaminating my product with iron oxides which needed to be removed afterwards. We'll also need some water, distilled or deionized as preferred, but filtered should also work as well. For this to work, we need a solution whose concentration is somewhere between 0.1 and 1 molar. We used a 0.1 molar solution, but according to the paper that this was based off of, a 1 molar solution gives a higher yield. I'll be repeating this in the near future, and we'll share the results of that in a future video if it is actually better. That said, even at 0.1 molar, this process still works very well. To make our solution, we weigh out 15 grams of sulfate salt per liter of water to make our 0.1 molar solution. So measure out your water, and then add in the salt and stir until fully dissolved. To run our electrolysis reaction, we need a power supply in the range of 9 to 12 volts. We could use 9 volt batteries, but they die very quickly and are expensive for this purpose. What's far easier is finding an old wall wart that's rated for about 9 to 12 volts, and using that instead. After removing the end and stripping the wire, we add some jumper wires using alligator clips. The other end of the jumper wires were each connected to a piece of graphite foil. In the original paper, they used a platinum counter electrode, but I found that just using more graphite foil works fine. Place both pieces of foil in the solution that we already prepared, and make sure that they can't touch. Try and keep them as evenly spaced apart as possible. Then simply turn on the power by plugging in the wall wart. Because we're dealing with electricity and conductive liquids, be careful not to touch the setup while it's plugged in so you don't get shocked. The way this reaction works is that the electricity attracts charged ions to the graphite foil, and forces them in between the layers of graphite in a process known as intercalation. As they heat and gain more energy, they exert pressure on the graphene layers, eventually forcing them apart. As the reaction progresses, you can see large, flexible pieces of a jet black material coming off of the surface of the foil. This is the graphene we want. Let the reaction run until one of the pieces of foil has completely broken down. Then unplug the wall wart and remove the electrodes. 
Now we need to separate the graphene from the solution. This can be done using a simple coffee filter because the pieces of graphene are so large that they'll actually get trapped. Set up a funnel and filter and pour the solution through slowly. If there's any graphene left in the container, use some extra water to help transfer it. In my case, caught inside the filter was also the byproduct of iron oxide that was produced because I used iron sulfate as my electrolyte. To remove it, pour some dilute acid over the filter. I found that several washes of vinegar got most of it, but some dilute hydrochloric acid would have been far better. Then rinse with several washes of water to remove any excess acid. After that, the graphene can be left on the filter to dry. While this stuff is pretty good, it still isn't quite pure graphene yet. There's still a fair bit of graphite remaining, and much of the graphene has too many layers still. So to finish off the process, we use the same method that we used in the previous video, and use ultrasound to shake apart the layers. In the previous video, we used a mixture of acetone and deionized water as our solvent, but a strong solution of ordinary black tea works just as well. So, prepare your solvent of choice, here I'm using a fairly concentrated solution of cheap black tea, and add in some of the now dry powder. Stir to combine, and then place in an ultrasonic bath for about an hour. If everything was done correctly, the solution will turn a jet black color, which is a sign that graphene is present. And with that, we're done! The solution will stay stable for ages and is comprised of large sheets of graphene. The solution can be used as is, or you can use a centrifuge to separate out the newly formed graphene. What I love about this method is the scale at which graphene can be produced. Making the 2-3 to three grams of graphene in this vial took maybe a day, and no horrifying reagents were required to do so. And that was doing this on a small scale. This process can easily be scaled up to industrial levels for mass production of graphene. In the future, we'll look at how we can process this material further into graphene oxide. We'll then use the graphene oxide to produce a variety of other materials like foams and fibers. Graphene fibers are some of the strongest that have ever been produced, and graphene foams have amazing properties that lend themselves to use in all sorts of energy storage and fuel cell applications. So be sure to check back every other Monday for all of that. A large part of the work that you've seen in this video was done at SciHouse. SciHouse is the makerspace and biohacking lab that myself and a few others recently started in Jacksonville, Florida. So that we can expand our tool library and to help maintain the awesome space we already have, we recently launched a GoFundMe campaign. If you'd like to support the continued production of research and videos like this one, or if you're local to the area and want a space where you can come and work, I'd really appreciate if you head over to GoFundMe.com slash SciHouseJax and consider supporting. Even 5 to 10 bucks, the cost of an overpriced latte, will go a long way to helping us hit our goal. Thanks in advance from the whole team. And with that, it's time to wrap up this video. As always, if you've enjoyed, be sure to subscribe and leave a rating. If you've got an idea for other materials we should investigate, or things we should make with our graphene oxide, be sure to leave them in the comments down below. I love reading your suggestions. As always, a big thank you to all of my patrons who helped make this video possible. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.